Got it? All right, I'll begin. Dearly Father, we uh, thank you for today. We thank you uh, for the weekend about to start. Let's pray that you be with us. Help us to, uh, again, Lord, glorify you and what we do this day, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. Um, yeah, I think this is the only class I'm teaching today, so I hope you, you feel special. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to make it through this one. You really appreciate my... <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, I don't know about that. Uh, that is some awkwardly mixed sarcastic laughing, like clapping. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen that much sarcastic clapping at the same time by so many people. It's, it's really impressive, actually. Um, first isomorphism theorem. Um, this we know, right? Uh, this we're learning. Um, so if you have a group homomorphism, right, a function which preserves the operation of the group, then we have proved that the kernel of the uh, homomorphism is in fact a normal subgroup of the domain, and also the quotient of the domain by the kernel is isomorphic to the image. Okay, this is a very, very useful theorem, all right? It has three less known um, sort of big brothers, I guess, or little brothers, I don't know what you want to call them. Anyway, related theorems, the second, third, and fourth isomorphism theorems. Um, so in order to discuss those, we need to talk a little bit about the so-called normalizer. So this is the normalizer of H and G. It's defined to be the set of elements in the group for which the conjugate of the subgroup by G is the subgroup again. Um, of course, you could rewrite this condition as the left coset of H is equal to the right coset of H um, by G. And um, so if you want like an intuition for what this is, um, this normalizer of H in G is going to be the largest group in G, which is, which is Large, it's generally larger, of course, than, um, excuse me, is H in here? Like, is H a subgroup of the normalizer? What if I put, right, if I put H, if I put an element of H here, um, well, let's see here, I'm trying to think. Yeah, because if I put E here, right? Wait a minute, how to say this? Oh, if I put, I'm, I'm an idiot. If I put H here, like if I choose, if I choose an element of H, then an element of H times the, you know, the coset that's obtained by conjugating an element of H, it's equal to H again. That's just properties of cosets, right? The coset multiplication eats elements from the cos from the subgroup which you're forming the coset. So of course H is a subgroup of here. The point is, with respect to this group, H is normal. So this is like the largest. Uh, excuse me. It's it's basically the um, the smallest uh, supergroup of um, of H, which normalizes H. A supergroup is a uh, a subgroup which contains a given group. All right. So like, if um, if A is a subgroup of B, that means that B is a supergroup of A. It's just we don't use that term much, but it's sometimes useful, especially here. So, you know, a special case of the normalizer would be, um, you know, if H is a normal subgroup of G, well then, this is true for all G, right? So the largest group which normalizes a normal subgroup is just the whole group, right? Um, I, just, I said smallest. I think I mean largest, though, right? The small, what's the smallest subgroup which normalizes H. Oh, I guess that's, that's dumb. That's just the identity, isn't it? Okay, yeah. Like if I do E, H, E inverse, I get back to H again. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, did you guys see this in your homework, this normalizer? You might have noticed it. It appeared, I think, in one of the first or second homework problems where I said to describe uh, either the orbit or the stabilizer, I forget which one it was, but this was 
if you look at it, that's what that object was. I'm, I'm trying to think here. So under the conjugate, that wasn't that wasn't that one of our group actions like G? Oh, was the first one. Yeah, it was the first one was to prove that conjugating is uh, a group action and then describe right. its orbit and stabilizers. It was so this this one. <laughs> okay, so right, so the stabilizer here. What does it mean if we have a star h equals to h again? That makes a in the stabilizer of h, right? So the stabilizer of h is the normalizer of h. If I haven't said something wrong. If I said something wrong, please interrupt me. It would be helpful. Okay, so with that normalizer, we can state the second or diamond isomorphism theorem. If you have a group with subgroups A and B, and you assume that A is a subgroup of the normalizer of B in G, all right, then the product of A and B is a subgroup of G. Now, we've had a string of homework problems that have been bouncing off this thing, haven't, haven't we? Usually it's H and K, right? And um, I'm still working on the solutions to those. I, uh, anyway, I'm hoping we, we have a complete picture of how to understand the product of two subgroups. When it is a subgroup, when it's not, you know. This is one of those things we keep picking on bit by bit in the homework, but I've never really come back and systematically discussed. Anyway, um, punchline. Then the product of A and B is a subgroup of G. B is a normal subgroup of the product. And the intersection of A and B is a normal subgroup of A. Furthermore, AB mod B is isomorphic to A mod the intersection of A and B. So let's see here. Um, it seems like this gives us, like one of the problems we had was to the, the isn't this, doesn't this give us one of the results in the homework that you guys turned in today, like the counting? If I call, if I have like H and K, right? Oh, yeah, and if, if if H if H is a normal subgroup of um, is a normal subgroup of K, um, what, were H and K both normal subgroups in that problem? I can't remember. They're just oh, they're just both subgroups. Oh yeah, that that problem's a little bit more a little bit more subtle. The counting here still works. I mean, the the point is that this still works at the level of cardinality, even when A B is not a group. That's the funny thing. I guess that's what makes your homework a little, a little touchier. But if you add this condition that A is a, a normal subgroup of B, um, then this, this is that homework. It's exactly right. It's the, the size of, if you take the size of both sides, you've got the size of AB divided by the size of B is equal to the size of A divided by the size of the intersection using, um, you know, how the number of cosets relates to the order of the group and the order of the subgroup by which we're quotienting, right? Remember, we always have the order of G mod H is the order of G divided by the order of H, right? Provided that G mod H actually is a subgroup, and it is here. I think, again, in your homework problem, I don't think it is the case that H, um, that this actually is a group because you don't have that B is necessarily normal inside AB, inside HK. But um, anyway, that's the discussion I'm starting today. I'm not finishing today, okay? Let me just say that. All right, so here's a proof. Actually, this is not a complete proof. This is a proof sketch. Um, and it's pr probably the worst kind of proof sketch. It's the kind of proof sketch that says things like, oh, look, a homework problem. So given the A and B are subgroups of G, and A is a subgroup of the normalizer of B and, and G, we, quote unquote, meaning you, can prove that AB is a subgroup of G. So there's one of the homework problems that's attached to this lecture, okay? Um, next, you can observe that, um, and again, I need to write those up soon. My apologies. Um, all right, so B is a, now how do I know B is a subgroup of the normalizer of, of of B and G. Well, we talked through that just a second ago. That's like obviously true, right? Yeah. Okay. 
deconjugates itself to itself. Any subgroup is self-conjugate. And um, we've assumed that A is a subgroup of the normalizer of, of B and G. So you can put that together to get that any product of A and B is again a subgroup of this thing, right? Because that's in there, that's in there, so products again are in there because this is after all a group. Maybe that should also be part of your homework, prove that the normalizer actually forms a group. That would be an easy problem, right? To show that this thing forms a group. It's just like two-step subgroup test. It's like three lines. It's not bad. By now, that sort of problem should start to be easy to you. It might not be, but there's still time. All right. Um, so that means that B is a normal subgroup. Now, everything inside here, right? And anything in all, all the elements of here do what? They conjugate B back to itself again, right? So that means, in particular, the, the elements of AB conjugate B back to itself again. In other words, that is to say that B is a normal subgroup of AB. What does that mean? Well, that means that AB mod B is well-defined, which means we can go and define a map and uh, have fun. Here's a fun, fun map to define. We have phi going from A to AB mod B. You just define it by phi of A equals to AB. Just the natural coset map will do it for us. And it's easy to prove it's a homomorphism just by the properties of the factor group, right? And the kernel is x in A such that xb is equal to b. But hey, that just means x is in b. So we got like x is in A, x is in b. Well, that's just the intersection. And the image, um, I, I say it's a surjection. Is that clear to you guys? If you take anything in here, you might worry, oh no. I'm only allowed to use A for representatives. I can't hit the stuff that's in B, but the thing is we're modding by B, so that stuff. In other words, I can find representatives for the cosets in here just using A representatives. So I can take any one of those A representatives and I can map to it under phi. Admittedly, there's a small gap here. All right, so that said, you apply the first isomorphism theorem to phi. That gives A mod the kernel is isomorphic to the image which is to say that A mod A intersect B is isomorphic to A mod B, and also that the kernel, which is A intersect B, is a normal subgroup of A intersect B, which is what I said. The reason this is called the diamond homomorphism is this picture here. Um, so this picture, we have G, and then AB is a subgroup of that. This is a lattice subgroup diagram, right? So we have AB, subgroup of G, A is a subgroup of AB, B is a subgroup of AB, A intersect B is a subgroup of both B and A, and then finally the identity down here by its lonesome. All the diamond isomorphism theorem says is that AB mod B is isomorphic to A mod A intersect B. And again, this is true in slight, slightly more generality. If you drop the normality condition on A, you still get something about... Um, sizes of things here. It's no longer the case that AB mod B is a group, but you can still count the number of cosets in it. That's essentially the content of one of your homework problems today. <clears throat> I'll try to make that explicit connection when I write the solution to this homework from today, okay? Third isomorphism theorem. Oh no, this one's even just darker. Look at that. Just just, just, just full bore, just homework. Oh my goodness. What kind of monster is teaching you? Um, no, actually this one's easier to prove, I think. I've seen this as homework problems in about half of the abstract algebra books I own. All right, so about one out of two teachers agree that this should be a homework problem. Um, or editors of abstract algebra books you pick. Anyway, this is like a notational victory it's, it's like the quotient, I don't know, we've seen some of, un, un, you know, un, unjust notational, um, like this thing we had where if we had normal subgroups and we took the quotient by, if we took the, pro, uh, the direct product of G1 and G2 and we modded by the direct product of normal subgroups N1 and N2, then it was the normal, it was G1, G, G1 mod N1 times G1 mod N2. It's almost like the group products and the quotient in groups behaves the same as actual multiplication and division, you know. So, <coughs> so, 
I don't know, it's kind of funny when that happens. Of course, that doesn't constitute a proof, but it is a nice heuristic, yeah. Um, like, since these, like, are, like, theorems, like, they're, 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 like, what kind of problems really would we be using if they're just so, Problem passes course, mostly. Okay. Yeah. So we're, like, these, these are important in any field of modern mathematics where you're applying linear algebra or abstract modern algebra to concrete problems in mathematics. We've been using the second and third isomorphism theorems or, or generalizations of that every day we meet in, ab in algebraic topology this semester. Like it's always first, second, third isomorphism theorem. It's all, it's all over the place all the time. But, you know, you don't want me to bring to this course the problems where we apply these so much. I mean, maybe I could find one or two. It's a good question. Mostly the point of these is for you to get a chance to use the first isomorphism theorem to prove something else. The proof of the second isomorphism theorem is the first isomorphism theorem. The proof of this theorem also is based on the first isomorphism theorem. And the other point of this is just for you guys to again work on your conceptual understanding of cosets and what does it mean for a function to be well defined. Um, okay, but anyway, basically it just says you can, you can mod um, by subgroup. If you have, if you take a common quotient by H where H is a subgroup of K, uh, um, then G mod H mod K mod H is just G mod K. So it's kind of, kind of neat, I think. Um, I think there's a picture in Galian which is pretty for this theorem, but I, I don't remember where it was. Then, so I'll try to state the, the homework will not just be prove the theorem. I will try to give you like A, B, C, some guidance. I'll suggest the mapping and so forth. All right, it's not, I won't just leave you out to, I won't just, the statement of the homework is not just going to be proved the third isomorphism theorem. The, the homework will have substructure. Um, and in fact, in some sense, it's a silly homework because I'm probably going to post in course content a, um, a scan of section 3.3, I think it is, in Dummett and Foot, where all four of these theorems are proved. All right. But his proofs they're a little bit not, I mean, in here I want to see a little bit more detail from you guys than his proofs, all right? Um, so I wouldn't, I mean, I, I, I would want you to think through them and maybe add a few details. Okay, um, the lattice isomorphism theorem, aka the fourth isomorphism theorem. So the subgroup lattice um, for G mod N, where N is a normal subgroup of G, all right? can be read from the lattice of G, the subgroup lattice of G, of course, by simply collapsing N to the identity. This is slightly, I mean, let me show you. So here's, here's a page from Dummett and Foot. I, uh, I hope I don't get an email about violation of copyright. I don't, I mean, I mean, I'm, if anything, this should be an advertisement for the most awesome abstract algebra book known to man at your level, namely Dummett and Foot. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you might say, then why don't you use that for this course? Well, I don't want to crush you, right? <laughs> I mean, you should try to eat hamburger right now, all right? Dummett and Foot is, is steak. And... It's not just steak, it's like, hey, here's three pounds of steak, you have two hours. You know, I mean, it's... <laughs> it, it, it has, it's about 900 pages or so, and it really is an undergraduate book, but it is, uh, it's what all the best students in math are studying now. Anyway, so... <laughs> I will use that book most likely for 422, but we won't cover all of it. But by 422, you should have the experience you need to start reading something like that. Here's a page from it. Anyway, um, oh, also, 
I was, that's, it just reminds me, how many of you are planning to take 422? Show of hands. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 7. There needs to be three more people. Good just seven? All right, well, I will get mostly paid for that course. All right, and I'll teach it anyway. I don't care. But um, goodness gracious. Yes, I can, um, I can get a copy of this book from, uh, from India for about $20. <laughs> so. But I do much prefer the, uh, I do much prefer the, the uh, sort of European or, or uh, American printing because the, you know, the one that, I mean, this, this I, ha I got this for 40 bucks somehow a while ago. And, and, and the printing, you know, this, this hardcover one, the printing is really nice. It's like pretty decent glossy paper and, you know, it's, it's actually pretty professionally typeset. It's, it's nice. And this book does tend to come apart, but eh, not mine though. Um, the um, the copy of the East Asian uh, economy one, uh, its paper is really thin, and you can kind of see one paper to the next. I mean, so I don't know. I need to talk to you guys individually whether or not you want to go with which which kind you want to go with, because I know I personally very very much prefer reading from this one as opposed to the one that's cheap. But on the other hand, it's twenty dollars, so How much are eighty to one hundred. I know, right? <laughs> Hurtful. Anyway, here's the careful statement of the fourth or lattice isomorphism theorem. What is it? What? Um, and I'm not completely sold on using that. I got to talk to Bill. Mate, talk me out of it yet? Um, anyway, so here, um, this is the nuts and bolts of saying what I said about the diagram, all right? Here is, <coughs> excuse me, here's an example of this, 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 this theorem. I mean, don't be scared of the fourth isomorphism theorem. It actually gives me a problem I can put on your test, which is stupidly easy, all right? So, like this is the, without the double lines, just with single lines, this is the subgroup diagram for the quaternion A group. You have the one, the groups, group of order four generated by i, by j, by k, right? j, j squared is minus one, then you get minus j, then minus j squared is one again, so you got these four subgroups of order four, right? Um, which have in common one and minus one, right? Anyway, the point is that minus one is a normal subgroup of the quaternion eight group. And so what the, what the lattice diagram, what the lattice theorem says is that you can take the whole diagram and just everything below the normal subgroup, which, which in this case is one, you just blot out, and whatever's left above is the subgroup diagram for the quotient. This is the lattice diagram for Q8 mod that subgroup. So that's the lattice diagram for the quotient. He has another example here that's a little bit more powerful. Let's look at it. <clears throat> um, okay, so here's the, the lattice, lattice diagram for D8. By the way, I also haven't said enough to you guys this semester about lattice diagrams. I'm sorry about that. So partly to, to, to remedy that a little bit, I made a, I made a, a scan of the uh, rel relevant section in Dumb and Foot. I'll post that in course content. You guys can look at it. That at least gives you 10 nice examples of lattice diagrams that will help if you're, because some of you didn't, I mean, a lot of you had that down pretty good in the homework from what I remember, but a few of you are still a little bit shaky on what is, how do you, how do you construct the lattice diagram for a group, you know? Generally, it's, it's a pain. I think there's examples I couldn't ask in here. But here's, here's the, the, the lattice diagram for D8 is everything here, okay? Without the double, I mean, ignore the double lines, just think of the singles lines. That's the, the, the lattice diagram for D8. Um, and so the fourth isomorphism theorem says, by the way, you, you guys know that the, um, the center, right, the center of the Dihido group, right, is what? It's rotation, 180 degree rotation and the identity, right? Those are the elements which commute with everything. The center is a normal subgroup, right? So we can form the factor group by the center of the Dihido group, D8. And so D8 mod 
the center is a factor group. Its lattice diagram is exactly these bits right here. These are the, repre the coset representatives, I suppose. Um, and then like all of this is gone. So you just imagine squishing, get rid of all this. So I did, like squishing this to the identity doesn't quite do it justice. You also ignore everything like down here. It's gone. So the lattice, the lattice diagram for the quotient of D8 by R2, let me write it over here just to be, because this hand waving is, only goes so far. <coughs> so again, you have D8 mod the center of D8, center of D8 is the subgroup generated by, now he, he has R and S, what, what, what? R squared. Now, of course, R is equal to X. S is equal to Y in our usual lingo. Okay? Don't be distracted by that. And so the lattice diagram for the factor group is just this. Uh, what was it here? Uh, R squared again. So, I mean, in other words, this is this, which is really E, quote unquote. I mean, it's, this is the identity in the quotient, right? This, this is the identity subgroup. So if you look at this pattern, right, what's this pattern the same as? Do you notice? Right, the lattice, the, the di the lattice diagram for Q8 mod the subgroup generated by minus one is the same pattern as this one. So let's see here. We have D8 mod, um, you know, R squared, in fact, is isomorphic to Q8 um, mod minus one, right? So these are, these are isomorphic, right? And um, is it true? Like, what is this? This is a subgroup of what? Order what? Minus one, one. Subgroup of order two, right? How about R squared? It's a subgroup of order two. So we even have that the quotients, R squared, and minus one are isomorphic, right? They're both subgroups of order two. They're isomorphic to Z2. And yet, right, even though the quotients are isomorphic, it does not follow what? Yeah, D8 is not isomorphic to Q8, all right? So, I mean, you'll have to take my word on that. Oh, bad algebra or somebody who doesn't know what a function is. It depends on the class, I don't really know. But. Maybe, both. Mm. <laughs> Maybe both, yeah. All right, so I wanna to get to a point here. Um, so um, what Dummett and Foote point out here is that just because two quotient, I mean, it's not, you can't put back together, it's hard to put back together these groups. If you know information about the quotients of two groups, right? Even if you know that the quotients are isomorphic, it doesn't necessarily allow you to go back and, and get that this and that are really the same, the same group, right? This is a tough <coughs> problem. Sorry, excuse me. There's a story I want to tell you now in the time that remains. We have time. All right, so let me, story time. So, so here's what he says. This is from section 3.4 of Dummett and Foote. He says, the remarks in the pre preceding section on lattices leave us with the intuitive picture that a quotient group, G mod N, is a group whose structure, e.g. lattice, describes the structure of G above the normal subgroup N, but this is kind of vague. Um, but basically what he says here is that the idea is to somehow, you know, we, we'd like to somehow fix that 
problem and be able to figure out when is the Q8 and the D8 the same or not the same. I think I'm being vague here. Anyway, sorry, let me get to the point here. All right, all right, all right. Sorry, I don't, I don't want to say everything in this section, so I'm trying to decide what I should tell you. <coughs> Excuse me. So what have we done? We have shown that the groups up to order six fit into certain isomorphism classes, right? We classified the groups of order one, order two, order three, order four, order five, order six. Oh, I guess while we're at it, seven, right? Seven's prime. <laughs> so that's not hard. When you get to order eight, there's more out there. Um, and so, you know, there's just this question, naturally, of how to describe the structure of groups as you go on. And one program to do that is the so-called uh, Holder program. Um, so let me write down the points in the Holder program. Sorry, if I was... Well, anyway, you can read, you'll have to read these sections in Dummett and Foot eventually to, com to, to fill in the gaps of what I'm saying here, but uh, here's the Holder program. The Holder program is this. Number one, classify all finite simple groups and then two, um, find all ways of putting simple groups uh, together. <laughs> Let's see here. Let me be a little bit more precise about that. He, he gives a little bit more pre precision here. Um, so like an example of this would be something like if you have A and B um, and you wish to find G, find a group G with um, um, well, G and N with N a normal subgroup of G and um, where N is isomorphic to B and G mod N is isomorphic to A. All right. Basically, he says, he gives an advertisement for the next chapter in this book, which is on group actions, and he says, you know, that helps actually achieve this program there. Now, <coughs> let me tell you more. This is an ongoing story. So this number one here was completed around 1980. All right. This result, it's about 10,000 pages, five to 10,000 pages of journal articles, all right? Um, so it's like, you know, mathematicians were pretty hard on that for a while. I think the Holder's program was stated around the dawn, maybe early, early, early 20th century, all right? Um, this became clear that's what they wanted to do. This all ties back into the story of when, when can you or can't you solve uh, um, a polynomial equation by studying the Galois group, all right? So um, it all ties back into that. But here, here's, the, here's a little slice of it, theorem. Um, there is a list of 18 infinite families Eighteen infinite families of simple groups.
and 26 oddballs, 26 what are called sporadic groups. Such that every finite simple group is isomorphic to one of the groups in this list. Now, what was a simple group? Um, I won't actually give you the list, all right? But I can state it at this level of specificity. It doesn't take us too long. <clears throat> Do you guys remember? We defined simple group earlier. What was a simple group? Here's a way you could think about a simple group. A simple group has no interesting quotients, no interesting factor groups. In other words, if H is a normal subgroup of G, then either H is equal to the identity or H is equal to G. So in other words, the factor group is either the group again or just the identity group. There's no interesting factor groups. So you can't make a simple group sort of into something else by factoring. It's kind of already atomic. It can't be further reduced. So these are the building blocks. Simple groups are the building blocks for building groups, is the idea. And this result says, we have found all the Legos in the universe, right? The problem of building Lego sets, if you will, ways of putting them together, this is still very much an open problem. We know results here, but we don't know in general what's, there's still work to be done in, in point two. I will tell you a famous result which everyone should hear because it's just, it's just wrong. Here's the theorem. If G is a simple group of odd order, all right, then G is isomorphic to Z mod a prime for some prime p. This is the theorem of fight thompson I have mentioned this before in the notes, but it is somewhat sobering to hear that this theorem requires a proof which is 255 pages of just packed, hard mathematics. But, I mean, I, I, to me, I don't know any theorem which has a more simple statement. Uh, sorry, pun slightly intended. And yet, requires such effort to prove. It's maddening. Like, what? Why should that be so hard to prove? But, yeah. So, you can, you can study it. If you Google it, look it up, you'll, you'll find out more. It's part of why both of those guys are respected like they are. Any, any, <laughs> what is it? <laughs> oh, homework problem? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, if I was assigned that as a homework, I would uh, go to the interlibrary loan. I would get a copy of the paper. I would, you know, spend $20 to copy it. And then uh, <coughs> I would hand it, hand it in. <coughs> I mean, there comes a certain point on a test when a professor tells you you can't use a certain theorem that you love. If you're a good student, you prove the theorem and use it. <laughs> I don't know what that has to do with what you're talking about, but it seems vaguely relevant. So, that is a brief, I mean, anyway, this, this program of classifying simple groups is a very big story. The last thing in this sporadic groups, the so-called monster group, it, books have been written about it. It's very an interesting story, it's fascinating, fascinating story. Listen, guys, um, so I have your homework for you. You can turn off the video. Let me get to your homework.